Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, we're going to talk disability and mental health as I am joined by award-winning singer, songwriter, and author, Heather Hutchison. Heather focuses on teaching people about mental health and disability through music and writing. So Heather, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Why don't you start off by giving everybody a little bit of background about yourself? For sure. As you said, I'm a singer, songwriter, and author. I have three albums out. I'm working on a new one right now, which is really exciting. I live on Vancouver Island in Canada, and I just released my memoir called Holding On By Letting Go, which kind of details my life as a blind person in Canada and Latin America, as well as my struggles with mental health over the years, which ultimately culminated in me being hospitalized for psychiatric care in at the beginning of the pandemic. So it kind of gets into what that hospitalization was like as well. Well, tell us first what life is like as a blind person, but even as a blind person in different countries? Yeah, so I would say it's definitely different between here and Canada. I would say, and I'm going to make some huge generalizations here, but I would say in Canada, people I meet kind of have one of two responses to my blindness. They either pretend that they're super cool with it and they crack jokes, and which is cool. I like a good blind joke as much as the next person, but they've, they're not that original when you've heard them all a thousand times or they get super awkward and you can tell that they want to ask questions, but you know it gets to the point where there's this elephant in the room because they don't wanna talk about it and they don't wanna bring it up. And in Latin America, I would say people are generally more willing to meet you where you are. So a little more accepting of differences and a little more observative. So they don't ask very many questions, but they kind of observe and, and figure things out and just really treat you like you're, you know, one of them. Well, let's talk about your hospitalization. Kind of tell us about that and tell us what that was like. Yeah, so I was hospitalized in June of 2020. I had been struggling with major depressive episodes well, for a long time, since my early teens, and they would come and go. And in November of 2018, I entered into one that didn't end, and it kind of went on and on, and I set up an emergency meeting with my doctor. They changed my medication, gave me more outpatient supports, and things were getting better, but then the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March, and it was, you know, my doctors and therapists stopped seeing people in person. They were seeing people, they were just having phone consults, not even video calls, so they couldn't really see how I was deteriorating. So during those months, things just got worse and worse. I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating. And I decided that because things were so out of control in my life, the only thing I could control was how and when I was going to die. But I decided that before I did that, I would go to the hospital kind of as a, a last ditch effort um, for my friends and family because I wanted to, them to know that I had tried. So I went into the hospital. I wasn't expecting them to keep me, but they ended up um, certifying me under the Mental Health Act, which means that I wasn't free to leave. And it was, people always ask if it's like it is in the movies, and yes and no. I mean, there is a lot of drama that happens, but it's not constant, I guess, like in the movies. It's actually not as bad a place as people kind of make it out to be. There's a lot of therapy, there's a lot of, um, like holistic wellness classes and things like that. So it's, it's you know, 
you do get a variety of supports for patients who are not able to just have outpatient supports at at a certain time. Well, when did you first know that you wanted to share your story by writing a book? I was in the hospital, actually, when I first kind of came up with the idea. People had been telling me for years that I should write a book, but I never really had much to say, I didn't think. And I was, you know, busy with songwriting and things like that. So I thought that was enough way to express myself. But this one night I was in the hospital and I was lying there, I couldn't sleep. And a patient was transferred in by air ambulance in critical condition. And as soon as they got there, they called a code blue. And so I'm lying in the bed and I'm thinking about this person's loved ones and thinking like, my God, they must be having one of the worst nights of their lives. It must be so scary. And then I started thinking about my own loved ones and thinking, well, how can I feel so much empathy and compassion for this person's loved ones while knowing the decision I want to make will you know, devastate my own. And then I, I was thinking of the patient and I thought this person is fighting to live and I'm fighting to die and I have a choice here. And if I choose life, then I need to do something good to try and help and support and educate other people so that something good can come out of this really difficult situation. Well, let's talk about the songwriting and the book writing process. How does it differ? And tell us about those processes. Yeah, so songwriting, I think you can kind of hide behind metaphors a little bit more or you don't necessarily have to be writing songs that are super personal. I think as songwriters, we often do, but there's a little more ambiguity, I guess, to it. So it, it feels a little more freeing in terms of you can say things and it doesn't necessarily have to be about you. But when you're writing, like especially a memoir, you're telling your story as it happened and there's no hiding behind metaphors. You know, if I knew if I was going to write this book that I had to tell the entire truth and even the the messy, unfortunate parts of it. So, I mean, there was definitely more anxiety with with writing the book because, you know, you're writing about people who are still living and you don't know how they're going to take it. You don't know how people are going to react to your story. So it is a little bit more close and personal, I think, writing a memoir than songwriting. Tell us about the positives and negatives of being blind. Okay, we'll start with the negatives first, I guess. I think the biggest one is people's perceptions of blindness. And I think they often want to talk about blindness as, you know, oh, it's so sad, you can't see the sunset or your loved one's faces. And I think that's a really good way for them to look at blindness so they don't have to, you know, it's something a little less tangible when in theory, if you really, if they really stop to think about it, there are things that they could do to make my life and the life of other blind people easier, you know, instead of feeling pity for us, we don't want your pity, we want your acceptance. So, you know, hiring a blind person, making sure your business is accessible, things like that. So I think perceptions is the, the one really big negative. Positives, I think we learn a lot of patience because, you know, if you're a blind person, you're not going to be running across the street halfway through a light because you don't know when the light changed or things like that or you're waiting on bus schedules or people to drive you places so you you kind of become more patient I guess and other positives I can do my makeup without a mirror so that's the win so for someone who might be struggling with mental health right now and feeling hopeless what words of encouragement would you give them I wouldn't tell them empty platitudes like cheer up tomorrow's another day, things like that, because I know when I was going through it, that would be the point that I would stop listening to the person talking to me. But what I can tell you is there will come a day when you will stop in a moment and you'll feel so much joy in that moment. And you'll think to yourself, I would have missed this. So I just really encourage you to hang on for that day because it's worth it. What? 
how has music played a role in helping you manage your depression and anxiety over the years? And what other techniques have you used to help manage that? Music's been a huge help over the years. I can't remember a time when I didn't have music in my life. Even when I was a little kid, I would carry around this old tape recorder and like write songs as I <laughs> went about my life. And then as I got into my teen years, I started taking it more seriously and I started writing about the things that that I was feeling and it just really helped to sit down at the piano and and it really helped to make sense of the things that I was feeling that I couldn't maybe articulate in, you know, spoken words. And then when I was 15, I entered a singing competition and I, in the finals of that competition, one of the judges who was on the panel is a producer and he came up to me backstage and he was like, you know, we should <laughs> record an album together. And I kind of thought, oh, cool, but it's not going to happen. But three weeks later, we were in the studio <laughs> recording the first album and the studio is like my happy place. I love it. I think I felt so much acceptance on that first day. All the musicians, you know, they weren't looking at me like the blind girl. They just saw me as a, another musician, a girl who loved music. So I think the acceptance has always been a big piece of it for me, the acceptance and the expression. And then other techniques that I've used, uh, mindfulness is a big one. So, you know, techniques like you're, you imagine yourself on the bank of a little stream and you're, you're all alone and it's warm and you have your hand in the water and leaves are flowing through your hand in the current and you, the leaves are thoughts and you can choose to grab onto them or not. So, you know, you're letting those worries and those negative thoughts, um, you know, glide past your hand in this kind of, um, exercise and i guess i like it because it, it's fairly tangible i think a lot of um mindfulness exercises can be quite visual how has blindness played a role or contributed to your depression and anxiety i think it's definitely played a role it's not the whole story and i think for years i was kind of awkward or concerned about asking for help because I figured if I did, everybody would just be like, oh, well, you're blind. Of course you're depressed. But, you know, there's so much more to it than that. But I think the isolation that that can come from it, I think I was always acutely aware of the people that weren't comfortable around me. School and things like that, because people just didn't know what I was capable of. So I think, yeah, a little bit of that isolation, you know, was caused by blindness. When did you first realize that you were struggling with mental health, depression, and anxiety? I was really young, probably about seven, and I started having panic attacks. And they were really scary at the time because I didn't know what was happening. I was just a little kid. And there wasn't a ton of support out there at the time for kids. I hope it's getting better. But at the time, you know, my parents would talk to the doctors and the teachers and they would just say, oh, she's just an anxious kid. She'll grow out of it. But I would get home, sent home from school because I would get sick a lot. And as I got older into my early teens, I think the anxiety kind of morphed into depression because nobody wants to feel like that all the time. Well, what was your life like growing up as a blind child? And also talk about some common misconceptions about blindness that people have. It was actually super normal. I, you know, hung out with my brother and my cousins and my friends and we would go rollerblading and slip and slide and, you know, have lemonade stands and all the things that little kids do. I think until I was probably about five, I didn't even realize that you know, society viewed me as any different from anybody else. And then I was playing on the playground one day with this kid and he asked me why I never looked at anything. And I just told him I'm blind, like super matter of fact, like, you know, I have brown hair and blue eyes, <laughs> no different because it never really occurred to me at that point that it could be construed 
as something negative and he actually pushed me and ran down the the slide and jumped on his bike and left um, because he was so uncomfortable with the fact that I was blind so that was the first time I really realized that I was different but yeah it was super like my home life my school life in terms of my friends and things was was very normal and misconceptions that our senses are all amazing <laughs> and heightened and they're not really we're born with the same senses of, as everybody else they just get more um defined or refined i guess attuned to the environment when we are missing that one sense and more misconceptions that blindness is all or nothing you know you can either see or you can't and it actually exists on a continuum so you can be totally blind or you can have light perception you can see some shapes you know it really depends on the person for me i see better in certain lights and on certain days than others so it's it's a very like fluid thing it's not this all or nothing you're blind or you're not well tell us about your book and tell us about your songs your albums that you got out yeah so the book just came out a couple months ago and we just released the audiobook of it as well so i'm really excited about that i narrated it and it was way more work than i thought it was going to be but i'm glad that it's out now and so it's available on amazon and audible and apple books and everywhere you get your books pretty much in print ebook and audiobook and my music the three albums that i have out so far are on spotify and apple music and all the places youtube everywhere you listen to music and hopefully there will be a new one coming out soon well tell us the name of that book and what people can expect when they read it the book's called holding on by letting go and it's just a very personal account of my life really starting at the beginning and progressing through the different stages, you know, childhood, adolescence, um, you know, university, all those things. And the, I guess, different struggles I had with blindness and otherwise. And then it, the second half of the book really gets into my hospitalization and the therapy I went through and things like that, what things were like in the hospital. And tell us the name of those three albums so people can check them out. The newest one is called Where the Ocean Meets the Sand. Then there's another one called Charades. And my very first one that came out when I was 16 is called Hello. All right. Well, you think you could sing a little bit for us, kind of demonstrate your voice or maybe one of your top songs, just a little bit of it? Do a little acapella for, for the audience? <laughs> a little acapella. Uh, let me think. I'm awakened by your teardrops in the shadow light of dawn. We know it, there's no secret. We don't have too long. You don't need to tell me I've been slipping away. I don't know who I was, but I know I'm not the same. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Canadian version of Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> that was nice. When is that new album going to be out? Do you know? I don't know yet. We're actually hopefully starting the recording in October. And then I, I kind of hope in the spring, I'm like a little hesitant to give really firm dates because all these things, they always take longer than you think they will. But soon. <laughs> Do we, do we just type in Heather Hutchison? Yeah, you can check out my website, heather-hutchison.com, H-U-T-C-H-I-S-O-N, and all my links to my social media and my book and my albums are there, so you can check it out. Perfect. That was the next question. One final question for you. Give us some final thoughts before we close it out. Final thoughts. Give yourself grace because... 
you're you and your best might not be somebody else's best, but if you're doing your best, then that's truly what matters. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out Heather Hutchison on your favorite platform. Check out the albums, check out the book. Also, be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. After listening, listeners, go to the Google Play Store and download the Living a Dream with Curveball podcast app. Heather Hutchison, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. Dream.